So one of one of the running tours that I guide for um, Go Running Tours Montreal features the Olympic Stadium in Montreal. It's the Olympic Stadium in Montreal is the scene of the 1976 Olympic Games and and, and is very memorable for for Nadia Comaneci and the Romanian gymnast. That's the Romanian gymnast who scored a perfect ten for her gold medal winning performance. I think she only was 14 years old at the time. And she redefined her sport of gymnastics. But something that I did not realize um, was that the Montreal Olympic Games were missing 26 African nations who were boycotting in protest of uh, New Zealand's rugby tour of South Africa, who were excluded from sport at that time due to their racist apartheid regime. This took away the chance for the world to see Philbert Bailly at his pinnacle in the 1500 meters who at the age of 20 was redefining his sport. Hi, and welcome to Running Book Reviews podcast, where we review running books to help you decide if you'd like to read the book for yourself. We also hope that listening to us chat about running can help you keep you motivated about your own running and, or maybe inspire you to try something new. My name is Alan and with my co-host Liz, we are going to talk with author Philbert Bailly about his book, Catch Me If You Can. So Catch Me If You Can is the story of 1970s running legend Philbert Bailly's life. The book is divided into three parts, In the Shadow of Kilimanjaro, which talks about Philbert's upbringing and childhood, setting the pace, which talks about Philbert's introduction to the sport and the hurdles he had to overcome during his long and successful running career, chasing a legacy, which talks about Philbert's life after retiring his spikes and all the other contributions he has made and continues to make to Tanzania and the sport he loves. The book contains many black and white pictures of Philbert, along with other well-known runners from the 70s, as well as pictures of his family. A little bit about Philbert. Philbert Bailly is a legendary mile and 1500 meter runner from the 70s and an Olympic silver medalist in the steeplechase at the 1980 Moscow Games. He has run multiple world records throughout his career while serving in the Tanzanian military, but is most well known for his front running race tactic, which was not common at the time and considered risky if you wanted to win. The common run to win style at that time was to sit and kick. So basically just run as a pack and then try and sprint at the end to get uh, to win. Although known worldwide for his running, Philbert has continued to serve his country and help the Tanzanian people in many ways after he hung up his spikes. Philbert and his wife Anna started a school in their home with the goal of offering quality education while also transmitting their values of being kind and contributing positively to your community. Prior to this, Tanzanian parents would send their kids to Kenya or Uganda if they wanted a good education for them. And opening this school meant that parents were able to have them nearby and watch them grow. Today, there are separate buildings for primary and secondary schools under the Philbert Bailly School banner, and they have a scholarship program called 2020 and Beyond that helps send students to the US for higher education and a chance to continue their sporting journey. Philbert learned aircraft mechanics while in the Army and later studied education at University of Texas at El Paso, graduating in 1988. It is our pleasure to welcome running legend and extraordinary human being, Philbert Bailly, to the podcast. Welcome, Philbert. Thank you very much. That's a, that's a good one, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, good. I'm, yeah, I'm it's happy a really, that... It's a really review, yeah. I was listening carefully, yeah. We did yeah. good homework on your bio. Yes, That's we good. hope we hope that we did good homework. So, um, I guess our first question will be: How did you decide to write this book? Well, uh, you know, in life there should be a legacy and there should be a remembrance. You know, sometimes history uh, tells everything. I wanted uh, my history to remain, and uh, something to remain, it has to be written. Without being written, people will forget. Um. I wrote it in English. Uh, the reason is that uh, most of my readers, they might come from Europe, America, Canada, you know, where, all the countries which speak English and Africa, you know. Um, people were asking me, why didn't I, didn't I write in Swahili? I said, yes, but you know, Swahili can be translated. 
But I think uh, at the beginning, uh, my aim was uh, these people whom I share my life in running, I share my um, my good time uh, when I was a young when I was young and uh, racing. And most of my races I do it in Europe, America, Asia, and all these other places. Whereas Tanzania has been running um, as a hero, but uh, right now, if you ask some of part of Tanzania without them being asked who is Fibber Bai, some of the kids might not know who is Fibber Bai. People who will know me maybe are the kids of the 80s or 70s, but the 20th uh, kids, they will never know. But if they will read in their books or in my book, they will remember. That's why I say history tells. So I decided to write a book and uh, I wrote that book because uh, we as an athletes, um, we are not really uh, putting our life into history. So if they know you, they know you, but then they don't need to remember you at the end. When you die, everything dies with you. So I think even if today I expire, I die, my book or my history will remain. So that's a fantastic reason. I think you're the first one who's given us a reason like that. That's a fantastic reason for writing a book. It's a testament for, for, you know, for writing books and for, you know, people reading books. I mean, there's, you know, it's, it's every, every person that writes a book, it leaves a legacy behind. Yeah. I was interested to read your, your childhood in the first part of the book. Um, your, your, your father died before you were born. So you only had a, a mother. Um, but you know, the West kind of think about, uh, oh, single parent families, but it, it looked like you had like a big family around you of uh, cousins and uh, who ended up being like brothers and sisters to you. And w what was your childhood like? Did you feel like you had a big, big family around you? Yeah, my childhood life was really tough, you know, because coming from the poor people, poor, poor family. Yeah. Only poor family. Um, the, the family with no mom, with no father, uh, only mother. It is not really easy to raise the family. You know, in our in our costume or culture, um, when um when when our father died, uh the uncle, the brother of my father, usually took care of the family. And that's what happened to my, my mother because uh, as I say that uh, in my book that uh, I was born uh, when my father was already dead. So when uh, my father died, I was still in my mother's uh, stomach. Um, and a few months later, I was born. Then uh, my, 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 my other brother and sisters came along. Um, that were about seven because our family, we are nine, uh, two, sister, two, two girls and two and seven boys, being the firstborn. And uh, well, I took them as my brother because uh, is the, the blood is the same because my father and my uncle they have the same blood you know they come from the same father same mother so yeah. it, no, there was no problems about that in our culture at that time but this day because people are educated they might say no 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 um my mother should might say that uh, no i am not going to be married with my with her brother-in-law you know so but um in our costume uh at that time or in our i mean uh, in our custom it was it was okay so the farm we were raised by 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 not really my father but by my my uncle. So um, the life uh, those days was uh, you know we take much time in um, heading cow far place where we take them there for water maybe for feeding or for taking to to, to get salt you know. Um, it takes that let's say we can go and take the cow for I mean for we head cows for feeding for almost 10 15 kilometers away. And uh, we leave in the early in the morning and we come back in the afternoon. But we'll ask a question that where do you have your lunch? Actually, we have no lunch. The lunch we have, as I've said in my book, that we have, we always hunt. And uh, when we hunt, that was the time, uh, you know, we have got, uh, I, I have my, my, I think I mentioned in my book, I have got a dog called Simba, who was really uh, assisting us in hunting rabbits, you know, gazelles, you know, and uh, dig, you know, those small animals. And uh, that's our lunch, you know, we, we we hunt and you get those animals and uh, we we burn. I mean, we be, we do barbecue uh, at, the, at the the bush where we having um, heading cows. Uh, or sometimes you carry our own food and usually the food we carry is a dry food uh, because you can't take something which is uh, it is it is it is, it is uh, I mean you mix dry food. I mean we can have um, we mix maize with uh, with beans and then we just boil them. We put salt. 
and that is our, our group lunch, you know. So we carry them, and uh, it, but it's not all uh, always, you know. Sometimes we take risk, you know. We just go there, and uh, you know, um, eating wasn't a reason those days, you know. For us, eating wasn't a reason, you know. Like these days, there is a restaurant everywhere, you know. You can just go outside, mm. inside the house. There is a barbecue place, or there is a hamburger place, or there is what those days. There is nothing. There is nothing actually. Or else you pass by the by some people's farm, you get uh like uh, you get a maize sugar cane, not sugar cane, but you mean you just go to the to the farm and cut the sugar cane and and and, and you eat, you chew and then you get the juice and then that is enough for us at that time. Yeah. Oh wow, you think of that like uh, we we <laughs> will never experience that in uh, in the West, in America. Yeah. yeah. But even now, not only that, even now, kids, uh, because, you know, most of the areas where, you know, there is no more cow herders there, uh, they have been moved somewhere else because most of the people built on those areas and uh, there are so much farms. So you can't have cow herding because you don't feed our cows inside. You know, we, we take them away or for grass mm -hmm. or for salt and for that. And because there is no area at the moment, uh, the the number of cow headers has really reduced. And you know, my father was the, uh, he, he was he was, he was auctioning the, the, the goats, you know? So his business was to auction goats. He buy the goats and then he send somewhere else where they need barbecue, they need meat, uh, goat meat and all that. And uh, it is a distance. And uh, if you read in my book that he died where he was selling his goats in, in Bulu, that was his business, yeah. So um, I guess before we go any further, you, you talk a lot about your mother and how strong a person she was. And then in your book, uh, you know, you do have a very strong work ethic and it seems like you're always planning for the future. Like you have a very, uh, you know, you have a goal and you are able to very well focus on that and um, I guess make uh, make it happen later on do you do you think you learned that from your mother or were there other people in your childhood that you think influenced you uh, to be like that <laughs> yeah i think uh, all i learned was from my mother my mother was very strict disciplined you know she taught she taught me a good discipline you know once you go aside she will discipline you by uh, giving you a tenu or by beating you or by things like that you know, uh, beating in our country on those days is, is normal. You know, once you make a mistake, uh, you don't need to go and uh, to 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 the to the neighbor and say that my mother beat me and things like that. No, you have to accept you made a mistake. You are you have to be beaten. You know, one story is when I was selling uh, milk. You know, I lost my <laughs> the bottle. I didn't even lose the bottle. You know, I played them. I I went to play marbles with other kids. So I hide the. The bottle, but then uh, when I we finished uh, playing marbles, I forgot where I put the bottle. So I went home. Uh, my mother, because those bottles those things were very, 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 they're very expensive. So my mother, when I told her that I I lost the uh, the, the bottle, she didn't even get, she didn't listen to my excuse. You know, she said no, that you have to pay to pay to beat me. And then she beat me to death. You know, and uh, well, I because I made a mistake. You know? Um, but the next day I remembered. Uh, a few days later, I remember, ah, okay, I knew where I, I, I hide the, the bottle. So I went and get the bottle and send it to her. I said, mommy, you should beat me because of the bottle. Now I got the bottle. No, we're each laughing, you know, because the punishment has already been done. So there is no way they can return that one. But sometimes I told my mom, I said, mama, sometimes, you know, you have, I'm a young man, but you have to listen to me also, you know, sometimes. But he said, you didn't say that you forgot. I said that I lost. That's the only punishment I got. I got the punishment. I lost it is not because you forgot where you put it mm -hmm. that teaches you to be very careful very quickly I, I guess Definitely. Yeah, it's very disciplined, yeah. <laughs> we see your career is is one of being in the Tanzanian army uh, you joined the army in in 1970 and worked there uh, I think all the way until your retirement and and it was in the army that you discovered a little bit that you had uh, an ability to run um, and, and and they give you your first pair of spikes yeah, definitely. You know, the army, um, when I joined the army, I think I have, uh, they already know, knew that I'm a good athlete because uh, when I was in primary and, uh, and, uh, and secondary school, or, or my primary school at home, because I didn't join secondary at that time, I joined my uh, crash program of secondary school at the, at the army. Um, they, they had, I think, that I was, uh, I was a good athlete. 
So when I joined the army, um, because the program was there, they really gave me time to do my training and uh, to increase my training uh, in addition to uh, the course I was taking uh, to undertake my uh, my aircraft mechanic at the air wing, um, one of the air, one of the department of the uh, air force, I should say the army. Uh, it is not air force, I should say it's air transport, where we transport uh, the soldiers, you know, or, you know, transporting equ uh, equipment and things like that. When I was there, I was given the opportunity to train, and uh, I really, even in my book, I really appreciated for the army uh, generals. I mean, people. I mean, the the head of army allowing me to train and uh, do my training, give me freedom. But uh, sometimes I do also my army uh, uh, responsibilities. It's not only that I was the army man, but I don't do responsibilities. And even when I was promoted for the first time to be a sergeant, I have to go and uh, take a course for being a sergeant. And then I was promoted to be a lieutenant colonel, lieutenant colonel, lieutenant colonel. Uh, I also went for a course, and then I was promoted to to captain. Yeah, what I'm saying is that uh, all my promotion was uh, was done due time, but I also went uh, the course which was needed for the promotion. It is not just like I was given uh, the promotion um, or the rank as a gift. You know, it is a gift, is an award, but I have to work for it. Yeah. That's why I attended all those courses until I reached the rank of major. So when you are in the army, um, when you first joined, so previously in your running, you never, you were never coached. You always uh, ran on your own. You were like self-coached. And then uh, I didn't have any coach, but you know, we were just in a group training, like uh, young men, you know, uh, like young men in a group. And then we trained, but then uh, there was the army coaches, but uh, I think uh, I always say, I think even in my book, I touched that uh, the coach of the athletes is the athlete himself. It is not the coach. Usually the coach is just supervising your training, but not really coaching you. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't, it is not in your heart. It is not in, in you training. If that training is not, you don't do it, then the coach doesn't have anything. It is yourself, your determination and your commitment. It is the one which thinks that I'm the own uh, coach myself. And at those days, you know, um, the coaches... Uh, they are coaching because just of ex because of experience. There are some coaches who went to uh, coaching courses, but uh, there are not so many. Uh, especially in the army, you didn't have those ones who had uh, taking courses like the IWF or the International Federation courses or the event. Uh, we had coaches tag. They start to uh, to be coaches, and at the same time, they were going some courses. You know, to uh, most of the coaches. You know, took their uh, their coaching courses in East Germany those times. A country, I mean, a city called Leipzig in East German, and mm -hmm. some of them um, went to Cuba in boxing and other sports. Those are the times which were few, co few uh, colleges we have for athletics coaching, uh, especially I mean the the, the, the Leipzig uh, East German in those days. But when I was in the army, um, we had a army coach, but uh, he was just uh, supervising and really. Uh, taking care of what we are doing and uh, putting our program, I mean, our, our times down. Let's say he was helping us in uh, timing our our, our, our our program. Let's say 400 meters times 10, and then he timed those 400 meters each. Mm. And uh, not really a personal coach like you have these days that you have our own personal, personal coach. No, we don't have that type of coaches. It is just the club coach who was coaching uh, all coach, all athletes, yeah. Okay. And so... You know, after you um, you joined the army and, uh, you know, you started really training seriously, it seems like all of a sudden you went from, you know, never having taken a plane to traveling all over the world for races. And you were uh, you were not even 20 years old at the time. So what was it like to to be traveling all over the world and um you know how did you deal with not speaking the language of the countries that you were traveling to did you find that scary yeah, i was very happy on that one i was very happy because you know um you know uh going back to 60s uh i was uh i was in my village and uh you know uh, when the plane goes above the sky you see the smoke coming back you know from the uh, from the plane you know i look up and I see this plane going and that there is a smoke. I didn't know it was a plane. You know, usually that smoke, which remains back like a snake, right? Yeah. And uh, the village, as a village boy, I say, oh, there is a big snake on the sky. But people are telling me that is an airplane. And they say, ah, are, these, are people, uh, are people carried with that uh, airplane? I say, yes, you can see that. 
up there, the people are in the airplane, and that airplane, the engine burst, remain. I mean, put the 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 the, the, uh, the smoke back, and that smoke get uh, frozen, and it remain to be like a snake. And then I say, okay, one day I will, I will, I will, I will go. I mean, I will uh, uh, board the plane also and travel like that. Then when I started uh, flying for the first time in 1972, actually, we had uh, we went to Zambia. When we had Eastern African Championship, but we went with an uh, army uh, army plane, a plane called, uh, made uh, made Canadian airplane called Caribou. So we went to Zambia for the first time. It was about two hour, one and a half hour. But then uh, after the Lagos, uh, when I won the All African Games, that's where I start uh, traveling from Tanzania to Europe. I mean to Scandinavian countries and Europe. Flying to me started those days. I wasn't really scared because uh, talking about English, I was um, 77 uh, Liva and I went to uh, a crash program at the army, um, army school and uh, English was the language we used to taught uh, to be an aircraft mechanic. You have to, you have to, you have to learn English. You have, they have to talk you with English. So all my classes were in English. So English to me wasn't a really strange thing. You know, like I can say, good morning, mm -hmm. how are you? Things like that. What's your name? My name is certain so, so and so. That was enough for me at that time because I was really busy with my training and my running. So mm -hmm. language wasn't really a big matter because I was going yeah. with a, either with a coach or with a with a manager. So the manager does all. So my work my work was really a small part. Yeah. In the sixties, the the um, let's say the Western world weren't really aware of Tanzania because. There was no real remarkable uh, athletes from Tanzania. And um, I think um, if you go back to the Olympics, for many people, the, the awareness uh, of, of Tanzania and Tanzanian athletes started with um, uh, a guy called uh, John Stephen Akawari in the 1968 Mexico Marathon, where he finished... 1968, yes, Mexico yeah, City, yeah. He actually finished last. John Stephen Akawari. Yeah. 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 Akwari, yeah. yeah. Um, what, what was, what was the story of, uh, of, of John Akwari and, uh, what did this mean to you, Philbert? Well, he was my role model actually, uh, because regardless of that, he was a marathon runner, but, uh, he's from Tanzania. And I know we first competed at the Olympic, at the Commonwealth Games, uh, in 1962 and then the Olympic Games 1964. So, um, there were no much good performance, but 1968, Tanzania was head in the world, not just because we had a gold medal or silver or bronze, but uh, that uh, uh, John Stephen Ahwali being last really brought uh, uh, Tanzania being top of the world because of the words he said, that my country didn't bring me to more than 5,000 kilometers to, uh, to, 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 not to finish. They sent me here to finish. So that one, that tape uh, and recording was used by the Olympic Solidarity as a sports as our Olympic spirit. So that was where Tanzania was well known because there was a clip which I think the IOC was using to, pro to promote the, the Olympic spirit. So that was why, because uh, John Stephen comes from my region or from my district, Mbulu. Those days, Mbulu and Karate were the same, we were in the same district. So he's like my older brother and uh, I was he was my role model also. So um, I should say that I think one of the motivation I had was from him also, as I said before that, regardless of him being the marathon runner, but just to 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 board the plane and go to this uh, uh, Commonwealth Games, you know, like the Olympic Games. I know those days, 1968, uh, I was still in Karatu in the village. Um, I didn't know that I, one day I would be like him or like others. And I, I was also hearing about uh, Kipchoge Keino of Kenya. And those are the people really who admired me and uh, in my book, I think I mentioned those. Yeah. So this is really what yes. I remember. Yeah. So you ran your first Olympics in uh, 1972 Munich Games, but didn't make it out of the prelimin preliminary rounds for the steeplechase or the 1500. How did yes. um, how did you go from that to then winning almost all the races you entered? Like, how did that motivate you? Well, I think I believe in uh, patient pace. Patient. You have to be patient for something good. You can't rush for something good. And this is what I always tell my kids, I mean, my people here in Tanzania, my athletes, our athletes, where I always tell them, people, you don't can't get a world record or perform well for only two years. You have to prepare yourself. Mm -hmm. I always give my example that I prepared since 1968 when I was uh, 
in primary school in uh, Karatu and Bolu. So that was the time when I was trying to, you know, I didn't know what I'm going to, to, to do in sports actually because I was playing football, I mean soccer, and then I was doing some other events, you know, like basketball, volleyball, all of those my my events. So um, 1972, when I went to the Olympic Games, that was the end of other events, other sports. I said, now I think uh, I have to concentrate in, in athletics regardless of that my army team in football really depended on me as a goalkeeper. So I said, I think I have to leave football and start playing, I mean, and, and start athletics completely concentrating in athletics. That's where I started, actually. And, uh, you know, um, 1972 and 74, when I went to the Olympic Games, uh, you know, Olympic is a big event in the world. And uh, maybe coming from the a small guy coming from Tanzania, were not well known. It was known because of Don Steven and the others in the 60s, but not really in a... Uh, in, in a place where they win medals or what, but um, I was very happy. I was very happy. I didn't really care about uh, uh, being not in the finals or second finals or quarter finals, but just to participate at the Olympic Games to me was really great. And do you think, um, because shortly after that, you, you know, it seemed like your time had come and you started winning all these races, but you were also being coached uh, when that happened. Do you think, um, that uh, your first coach Warner Kramer had, you know, had any uh, contribution to to your success. Yeah, I should say that I should say that because you know um, I have gone through different uh, coaches, but I will not say those other ones are not coaches. They are coaches because they have been standing for my training. Mm-hmm. But uh, Kramer has been uh, really uh, putting me into uh, the the program he was giving was a little bit difficult to me, but. Uh, for well, that time, I knew it was difficult, but uh, to other side, I knew that it is it was really building me to uh, to be the best. Yeah, I would not say that the other local coaches didn't really help me, but they helped me. But usually, we shared the training because mm-hmm. uh, before that uh, training, I mean, the coach of the athlete is the athlete himself. So um, it's the same as to Kramer because I didn't really spend much time with Kramer. Kramer was the university coach, but I always train the university track, and then we meet there and we train. He give me training, and I do that. And the way I wear, he's not there. Then I used to to do what he was. Uh, he gave me uh, in the previous training, and that was how. I, but I have to do it completely, not leaving the workouts in between. I train. Let's say if it is 12, uh, 12, uh, 400 meters, I have to do it twelve, and sometimes even more than twelve, uh, not to let him down. And usually, if you are coached by a coach and you do his workouts, and that's where he's uh, putting you into a uh, uh, more hard work. And that hard work really builds you. But most of the artists, when they're giving them hard work, they think that they are they are being punished. No, it is just the teach the coach wants you to train under under stress, under stress and under 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 under, under hard work. And uh, Alma was a different person. He was putting me into that pressure, and I was I really undertake the pressure. And uh, even the other local coaches, when they are training with me, usually we do the training which I was given. You know, they can't really introduce me with the new ones. The new ones sometimes, you know, uh, changing of the program sometimes it really, uh, I mean, hurts some athletes because mentally or psychologically you are you 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 tune yourself to certain training and then if someone come and change, it really disturbs some of the athletes. So um, maybe we should uh, talk a little bit about your love of the 1500 meter event, uh, because it seems like this, you love the 1500 meter and the mile more than any other distances. And you, uh, you ran mostly those in the beginning. So what was it about those distances that you loved? You know, those distances, uh, they're enjoyable, even for the fans. You know, they are not long, they are not short, Mm -hmm. but fun, fun being that the speed, you know, like uh, when I was, most of the athletes in the 1500 meters and 800 meters, they really use the 400 meter speed, especially for the 400 meter, for the 800 meters. And for the 1500 meters, you have to be good at 800 meters. So I, I was mastering all those. You see, like my best time in the 400 meters wasn't really good, was like 47. But 47 can make me run faster time in the 800 meters. And that made me to run like 145. But then wow. that because I have endurance, that speed will make me run good 1500 meters because I have endurance of longer distances and 1500, 800 meters was used for me as a speed because the 800 meters is, uh, I use that speed to run my 1500 meters. That's why 
when I run the 1500 meters, I run from the beginning. The speed is like 151, 152, 150.9, uh, or something like that. That is very fast. Yeah. I mean, it comes down. It comes down, not I was tired. I'm just regretting myself that now I have to change my system of running to a longer distance because I'm running 15. So I have to put some of the, uh, between the, 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 the last lap and the second lap to relax and try to reduce, uh, I can say shut off the, the fuel. And then when I came to the last 400 meters, that's where I opened my valve to release the, 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 the petrol or the, the power uh, to sprint. And if you have seen my, 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 my clip, the 1500 meters or in the a mile in, uh, in Kingston, Jamaica or the 300 meters in Christchurch, you can see in the 200 meters where the guys were killing each other, I was relaxing. Um, maybe we can um, just mention that we'll try and put a link in the show notes of the Christchurch 1500 meter Commonwealth Games final from 1974. Um, but I think you saw it, did you, Alan? Yeah, I looked at it. Um, it's it's a phenomenal it's a phenomenal race. Um, obviously, the, the the video is 1974 quality video, but just to put it into context, because Philbert is a front runner and he went off quick at the, at the beginning, um, everyone had to chase him and everybody ended up, I think the first six ended up running new record times um, because they had to go at the speed that he was setting. But he himself broke the world record. It was really the start of his showdown with um, his rival at the time, um, a New Zealander called John Walker who also went on to break the world record. And Philbert set a Commonwealth Games record in 1974 that was only broken the Commonwealth Ga at the Commonwealth Games in uh, 2022. So he, he set a record that stood at the Commonwealth Games for 48 years. That's incredible. I mean, there aren't that many records that stay for that long these days. So Yeah, you could go, well, it's the Commonwealth Games, but it's the Commonwealth that featured during that period all of the really great, great milers like Sebastian Coe, Steve Ovet, Steve Cram. These people all came through the, com you know, they're all part of the Commonwealth since Philbert Bailly set the record, but they couldn't beat his record. Uh, he was uh, telling us about the 1500 meter and how in the second to last lap everybody was struggling because they were trying to catch him and he was just relaxing well you know the thing is that you know few of my of my of my races i won like that you know like uh, 1973 in nigeria in uh, 1973 five in uh, uh, in uh, in kingston jamaica these are the course i was telling you. even 1919 1980s olympic uh, you know, I did the same thing, but then I think something happened with my techniques at the last. That's why Malinos, they let Malinos catch me at the end. But mm -hmm. I should say that uh, uh, they, my, my book to be called Catch Me If You Can, it was wrong because Malinos catched me. Yeah. Or oh, they have more craft catch me in Edmonton, Canada. No, but most of my races, local and international ones, I won like that. That's why my book was called, uh, is called uh, uh, Catch Me If You Can, you see. So I think, I think as well... Um... Before you came uh, into the 1500 meters, people didn't run like that. No, no, they were running. Uh, you know, they 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 they, they ran the, 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 the most of their races in 60s. You know, like 61, 60s, very slow. But then uh, at the last 200 meters, that's where people kick each other. You know. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah. one, once you came on the scene, nobody could run like that anymore because you would run fast from the beginning. Yes, yes, yeah, you're right, yeah. And I trained for that. You know, that's why uh, people are training. Uh, I went to some of the physiology uh, uh, uptake, oxygen uptake in Sweden, uh, uh, where they can, you know, like uh, test your uh, uh, oxygen intake and outtake and things like that. Now, and also I think uh, uh, those days, you know, I most of my training, people I don't be really in high altitude in the middle distance runners. I believe you can even train in the sea level training. I mean, sea level country, I mean, places where you can do good because most of my races, like one mile or 1500 meters, when, uh, before I went to uh, break, uh, broke it, I, I used to train at the sea level. 
So um, maybe for the long distance, like uh, 10,000 meters to marathon, high altitude is good. But for the, for the, for the middle distance, uh, to me, I think uh, you, can, you can do well even if you're training in the sea level. One of the things I noticed as well, in particular with the 1975 Dream Mile uh, that you referred to in Jamaica, where you became the double world record holder for the 1501 mile, it, yes. um, is that even though you beat everybody in 1975, for example, all the people who were chasing you were all, all ended up achieving their own best times, their personal bests or national records or uh, record times because... Um, they have to change the way they run and they have to run uh, their very fastest times. They can't be tactical and sit and kick anymore. Yeah, you know, you know what surprised me, and, and I think nobody realized that after that one, people were putting in these uh, invitational races, most of the race directors were putting uh, rabbits, you know, um, as, yeah. uh, people to, to do a, a, a rabbit, uh, what you call a spacing, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. That's where the pacing started because... Uh, I mean, most of the athletes, they can run by themselves uh, being uh, the pacer. See, I was the pace of myself. That's why I broke my, my two records. But uh, after that, people were, 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 the records were broken by people assisting. Mm -hmm. So, but for you, the front running, uh, it seems to have started because uh, more out of necessity, you became a front runner, I think, because uh, at, there was one time you got injured during a race and then it seemed to be that you wanted to just stay out of trouble. So w was that sort of the, the origin or, or was there another idea? No, that was one of the reasons. One of the reasons. You know, when you're in the groove, you don't enjoy running. But when you're by yourself, you can judge how much or how do you want to run yourself. And, uh, you know, when I ran in a group for the, uh, for the first time in, 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 in Oslo, in Bislet Games, that was the first time I, I tried. And then when I tried, I was spiked and I fell down. And uh, that was the end of my career. So I said, I think, why should I train and go by myself, good energy, good speed, and lead this, the, 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 the race. And if ever anything comes at the end, that's, we, you will find out what's going, to, what's going to happen there. But if you train good, nothing will happen because you will still challenge them. Even if they come to you, you challenge them. But if you don't train much or you don't train uh, good, then they, you can't have any challenge. When they come close to you, you give up and then they just pass you. So you say in your book that uh, the secrets to your success are sacrifice, commitment, and confidence. How did yeah. you identify those as your the three things that contributed? Don't to forget about don't forget about the hard work. Eh? Oh yes, definitely. There was a lot of hard work. Yes, <laughs> it is a sacrifice, commitment, hard work. And confidence. Confidence and determination. <laughs> confidence, confidence. I didn't put much, but confidence and determination is one of them. Besides, we have to determine. Yeah. First of all, uh, to start with uh, commitment. Usually, if you want to do something good, you have to commit yourself. Mm -hmm. Commitment, they, they will be sacrificed because you might uh, spend most of your time when training using other times of something else. So you sacrifice the other time. And then hard work, there is no performance without doing uh, without hard work. You have to work hard without being forced, without being told, okay? Mm -hmm. And then confidence, you have to be, be confident of yourself. If you're not confident, you can't do anything good. You have to be confident yourself that uh, I can do it, I can do it. And then all that, you have to determine. Determination is one of the best ones. You have to determine when you are attacking, when you wanted to, to attack a good, good race, you have to decide from your heart that I'm going to do it, that you determine to do it good, to work hard with confidence in it. So nothing can be done without all this. And what we are failing right now in most of the athletes in our country is they miss some of the things here. They miss commitment, they miss hard work, they think that you can break a record for only a year and then they are not confident of themselves and uh, there is no determination and they, they don't sacrifice if they have their own time. Let's say um, when I was running, I had uh, I have to sacrifice my family. And my family stayed away from me. Yeah? Mm -hmm. I say three 
uh, quarters of a year, I'm abroad. I stay with my family only three months. That's sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. So to me, and you 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 sacrifice your family and everything, and then you don't commit in your in your in your, in, in your program. You don't really do hard work, and then it, you you are not even determined. Then it is wasted of time for you to sacrifice your family if you don't use that part of uh, three a year. I think people see the wonderful results and the wonderful performances, and they they don't see all of those things that you're talking about. These are all inv invisible to the public. True. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. People see the other side, but they don't see really the right, the, the right place, you know, the right yeah. side. One of the things that um, you're, you're well known for, um, certainly I remember it when I was um, a, a young uh, kid um, yeah. watching the TV, was your fierce competition on the track with uh, John Walker of New Zealand. Um, yes. It was always Philbert Bailly of Tanzania and John Walker of New Zealand. And if there was a race with both of you in, uh, everybody in the world wanted to see this race. Do, do you think that, uh, you know, the presence of John Walker and the ability of John Walker uh, drove you both to better performances? And uh, I hear that also you're a great friend of John Walker. Is this true? Yeah, very, 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 very true. Very true. Very true. Very true. All the... Up all the all the all the project which uh, John was doing, he always uh, he 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 always he was uh, always uh, inviting me to attend, and uh, we remain even if uh, even last time when he met in 20, 2019 in Monaco, where we have this heritage mile uh, breakers, uh, we we had a dinner together, me and my late wife and his wife, and we still we still communicate and sometimes even uh, uh, when we uh, we met uh, we. Sometimes in the in the Facebook or in the Instagram, you know, like we, we chat and things like that. But uh, that that era has gone. You know, if you started with that era, 1970 to 1980s, uh, it was between John Walker and Fred Bay. But you know, you remember it started since 1960s when uh, I mean uh, Jim Ryan was the, the rivaling with uh, Kipchoge Keno of Kenya. So yeah. it is like those years was Kipchoge Keno and Jim Ryan. And then in the 70s, it's Kane, I mean, it's, 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 it's by and John Walker. And then in the 80s, it was uh, Steve Ovid and uh, Sebastian Koch. Yeah. So it is just uh, things like that. But uh, to be honest, I should say that um, uh, John Walker, my friend, missed me in 1976, where everybody was ready. And uh, I should say I was ready 100%, because two months before the boycott, I ran uh, the fastest time in the world of 3:34 in Tanzania, in Zanzibar, where we are opening our our, our artificial, I mean our artificial track. So that was the first time. And then two months later, it was the Olympic Games, and I was prepared to mm -hmm. win a gold medal for Tanzania in the 1500 meters of the Olympic Games. But uh, that one was uh, was taken out from the boycott, and uh, uh, that time because of uh, being human, I put athletics aside, and then I thought, I think, uh, as a human being, I have to sacrifice. You see, that is the sacrifice. Sacrifice my medal, even if uh, it was not a gold medal, maybe silver or bronze, but it was still the Olympic medal because of what happened to our brothers and sisters in South Africa. And we are not boycotting, actually, you know, we are not boycotting the New Zealand. We are boycotting, you know, the South Africans. We are not yes. we are in New Zealand because South Africa at that time we are not a member of the IOC. So they are not supposed to, supposed to compete at the Olympic Games. We are, you know, we we were just New Zealand who played rugby with South African apathy. At the same time, the killing was held in Soweto the wrong time. Wrong time. But see, there are so many athletes who sacrificed their, their 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 medals or representing their countries because of what was caused by New Zealand and South Africa. It sounds like, you know, for, for a lot of athletes, I mean, sacrificing an Olympic medal is a, is a big deal because, you know, you work so hard for so many years to get your chance to run in the Olympics. It's only every four years. And then, you know, you sacrifice that for um, for what was happening, like, like, I guess the bigger picture of what was happening to to other human beings and to make a statement. And um, it, it doesn't sound like you have any regrets about that. 
even even though the sacrifice was so big is that is that correct yeah this is what i'm saying yeah I, I, it is not a really big deal because you know um these things that's why i tried 1980 mm -hmm. uh, maybe done that one uh but the 1976 was the best one i should say that maybe i could have win because the time the winning time uh, by john walker was 339 and i saw the race in the in the videos youtube and all that you can see that the the race was a really fast uh, maybe it could have been even faster when i was uh, uh when i could have been there uh yeah. but, uh that really killed our dreams but we said uh, training for four years and then uh that thing happened only two months before the, the, the major major event it wasn't really uh it wasn't really good but being a human sometimes we said okay you sacrifice it it has gone mm -hmm. and then goes, life goes on yeah and uh, you did get another chance to run, but uh, I guess you had to shift a little bit because it was four years later in the 1980 Olympics. Uh, you finally yeah. won um, one silver in the 3,000 meter steeplechase. And yeah. um, you're one of the only, there were only two silver medals, one for Tanzania in the Olympics um, ever. So do you see any potential Tanzanian medal contenders for the next Olympic Games in 2024? Well, we have. We have. Not, not, not necessarily the 1,500 meters or the steeple chase, but we have good marathon runners who are doing very well. And uh, it is just uh, two months ago in uh, Birmingham where our athletes uh, ran uh, uh, one silver at the marathon race. And then we have got... Uh, some That's other good... the Commonwealth Games, Philbert? Yeah, the Commonwealth Games, yes. Yeah. And then uh, we have got one guy who's running 204. He went to the World Championships. Oh, wow. And, people, and unfortunately, we have, uh, being the Secretary General of the National Olympic Committee myself, we have given them scholarships uh, through the Olympic Solidarity uh, to train until the 2024 Olympic Games. And I'm sure with this Oli uh, Olympic uh, scholarship, they will perform very well. We keep our fingers. We keep our fingers crossed for uh, to see Tanzania uh, maybe uh, on the podium again uh, soon on the Olympics. It's a long Definitely, time. I, 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 yeah, I, I, I put my fingers across because the scholarship is a long scholarship, and this kid has already started uh, training. And uh, I'm sure if nothing goes wrong, like their health and all that, uh, the performance is there. I'm not saying that the other are, are not training, but it, it depends on how you train yourself. But if you kill yourself running too many races and then coming to the end of the uh, beginning of the Olympics, then you are tired, then your body will not take it. And that is what we are praying that we have to really put them into program whereby they will run a few races before the Olympic Games, but they will train more, put energy, mm -hmm. put strength, put everything. The, 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 the coaches have to go under to have been told that money will come after that because, you know, we Africans, you know, like... Uh, running in this professional race is like employment because um, these kids, uh, like uh, some of the kids, they're employed by the army, but some of them are not employed. Running is just like their business. So if they don't run uh, several races uh, between the Olympic Games, let's say between now and 2024, but they have to limit this race they are running because they can't just run any race. To me, I believe to prepare well and, and, and win good money. Because if you win the Olympic medal, it will take you to another four years whereby you can be invited, you can be given shoe contracts or equipment contracts, you know, and uh, you will live for four years and even uh, even beyond. So I believe uh, our kids to prepare themselves without being killing themselves from running so many races. Yeah, just to win some prize money. These young guys, yeah. uh, these young guys like uh, uh, Simbu, Al Alphonse Simbu and Gabriel Gai, uh, they are educated and they know what they are doing and I'm sure they will concentrate on what you are telling them to train and run few races for tri as trials and we allow them to go to these uh, a few races uh, they are, their transport paid and let them run and come back and train and uh, I'm sure if they will get any, any medal in the Olympic Games they will live with that and, they are, and their, their, their professionalism will pay because they will be paid good money the Olympic is not paying money, but then there are going to be so many invitations, and these invitations are paid money. And even the 
uh, the endorsements of uh, equipment and so forth. Yeah, you don't you don't win money straight off, but you you get a, oh, yeah. a profile which will allow you to earn money for the rest of your life, maybe. Yes, yes. One of the things with many athletes is they achieve uh, some greatness, and when we talk about their their legacy, you know, you spoke at the beginning yeah. about your legacy with your book. You tend to think about okay, their medal or their world record, but in fact, there's another aspect. Uh, completely to your story um which probably no. a lot of the world who follow running don't know about because you you and your wife your late wife anna started a a, a school yes because um i hear that uh, you know in in tanzania kids kids were actually sending their i mean parents were sending their kids to kenya and uganda to get good education. yeah those 70s yeah in the 70s yeah. and uh, 80s yeah so tell us about this school project that you started well, um, this started like a joke, you know, we didn't really <laughs> to reach uh, this uh, point where we have now. We started with seven kids, you know, at my garage in uh, in Kimara, where our headquarters is now. And uh, we did this because, you know, uh, our two girls uh, went to school in Kenya. And that was uh, because, you know, in our country, those days, uh, all the schools are taught in English, I mean, in Swahili, sorry. All the primary schools are taught in Swahili. And the one they reach secondary school, they are, they are taught in English. So we said, um, why can't you send these kids from the primary school to Kenya where they can learn uh, English and then they go through high school, secondary school, and then they know English. And uh, it doesn't mean that Kenya has got uh, good education. It is just because of that English, most of the Tanzanian parents, they were sending their kids to Kenya and Uganda. Uh, we said, why can't you start a school in Tanzania and have teachers from Kenya? If the problem is the teachers, Let's have Kenya teachers or Uganda teachers here and uh, advertise and tell our parents here, Tanzania parents, that we have Kenya students, I mean, teachers, uh, bring your students in our school. They will get the same education as they got in Kenya and Uganda and uh, pay not the same fees as they pay in Kenya. So um, we said, let's start this one. And we get, uh, I mean, motivation from other parents. They said, oh, if you start this, we can bring the kids to you. And then we started. And I'll be surprised we started with uh, well, people who doesn't who doesn't know. Uh, they think that we started from from top up there. We didn't start up there. We started from the bottom. We started in the garage where I had my parked my cars, and uh, we made that as a, as a class. And uh, we made our sitting room as a dining where the kids sit in dining because they we started with seven students uh, the first year, and uh, the teacher from Kenya arrived here, and uh, we advertised and. Uh, the Kenya and the Tanzanian parents start uh, bringing the, uh, the students to our school, especially in the nursery side. And uh, the second year, we had uh, 18 students. The same year, we had about 36 years, I mean, 36 uh, students. That was 1990, uh, 1996. We have uh, 36 uh, students. We have to think about extending the, the garage now. We, did, we said, okay, we start building small buildings for the pre-unit and uh, and uh, uh, and the uh, standard one. So uh, if you get a picture of where we have started, you can see what I'm talking about. You can understand what I'm talking about. We started in the garage, and then we built uh, small uh, classes for, 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 for pre-unit and standard one. And that's where we start, bring, uh, parents start bringing students. We had, uh, we had, we put another, we, we hired another Kenyan teacher with Tanzania teachers, because Tanzania teachers always teach. They are not bad. I mean, it doesn't mean that they are bad. It is just they're teaching in Swahili, but there are some teachers who teach also in English. So we had them. Until uh, 1997, uh, we had uh, standard one. Standard one, we had about 70 something students. That means the number has increased. And at that time, it wasn't only my school. People are starting to, 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 to introduce private schools in Tanzania. We have St. Mary's, uh, uh, Kibaha, I mean, K K K K Bezi, we have St. Mary's. Tabata, you know, and we had some other schools which were open. And uh, my school was first called St. Mary's uh, when we all, uh, when we started uh, in 1996. But uh, because there was another St. Mary's, we said, no, people advised me to change the name because most of our students were getting into other schools, uh, St. Mary's buses. And uh, we said, okay, then we have to consult the, 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 the Minister of Education that our school will be changed to be followed by a national primary school. 
unfortunately, unfortunately they, they allowed us to change and we changed the name until uh, we're using it today. But uh, the reason was that, and uh, we said that uh, taking the, uh, the students to Kenya, uh, it is a different culture. Uh, you know, uh, Tanzania speaks fluent English, but Kenya and Uganda, they don't really speak fluent English. But when our student goes to Kenya, our kids goes to Kenya, when they come back, that language, Swahili language, the accent and the culture changed. You see, in Tanzania, if you want to ask somebody, uh, even a water, you say, may I have water? May I have something? You put may I, please, mm. may I? Yes. But in Kenya, you don't say that. They say, if you say may I, they think that you want that thing free. Eh? What they say, in, they say, I want. But for us as Tanzanians, I want is not a polite language. We no. say, mm -hmm. may I have, may I not give to me. Mm -hmm. You better say, please, can you give it to me? But don't say, or you say, come here. You see, no, you say you can't say come here in our accent, in our in our tradition. You say, please come here. You, see, you have to, to put please. But mm -hmm. in case it's just like a, a demanding, I mean a commanding. Come here. Hmm? Yeah, and in Ke in Kenya that doesn't appear to be that's not a problem because that's their culture. But yeah. when you do that in Tanzania, it seems rude yeah. or uh, impolite. Uh, you see, so we said, okay, our 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 our, our, our parents said, okay, why can't you bring to Tanzania schools where we can have uh, our tradition, you know, our culture? So that's why then the business sending uh, kids to Kenya died because people were building schools and schools, and now there are almost more than one thousand schools in Tanzania, private schools. Oh wow! So, so I guess this aspect of preserving your culture was was that like the most important? Like, what what was uh, sort of the most important aspect? You know, when because it's a big it's a big project to start a school. So, what kept you motivated the most? Was it to preserve the culture? Yeah, it is culture and it's culture and uh, and uh, respecting our. I mean, especially respecting our culture. And some difficult if the students goes to Kenya for let's say six months uh after six months I'm telling you when they come back home they're changed they are different ones they forgot okay. about the, now they're in Kenya culture so yeah I think that is the one thing the culture changes yeah so we hear the story about you starting uh, a school in your garage with seven seven students and then building it all the way up to a huge school building and you keep continually uh having new goals and new projects. I think you're applying your, your running uh, sacrifice commitment, uh, hard work to uh, outside of running now. And yeah. even now we, we hear about you have a mission with the school to have a synthetic running track at the school campus. I read in, in your book. Um, so oh. is that still progressing or did you achieve that? Uh, uh, Alan, yeah. Thing is not easy. It's tough. It's tough. <laughs> tough. Everything is tough. As we go along, everything goes tough. You know. Yeah. Um. Actually, um. As you said in my book, I said that, but uh, it needs assistance. It needs good wishes. It needs people so, from, not from Tanzania, from all over the world. Even if when I even when I launched my book in in, in Birmingham, I said that. I said it is not. I'm. I am launching this book. I want anybody who buys this book will be contributing to my dream. And my dream was to have Tatan truck or a synthetic truck because I tried to some friends and all that, but I think uh, they are not willing, but the will should come from myself. I know if I don't do it, maybe someone else will do it in future. Because even if I expire, my project will still sustain because it is the project and I have got people to run it. Maybe in many years to come, the synthetic might come, but it's still my dream. It will remain my dream. And I still insist, anybody who buys my book is not just reading the book, but is also contributing my synthetic track in my school. And um, I'm taking that seriously. Even my wife, where she is now, she might be thinking about that. That's our dream. We went have everything in our projects. Netball, we started Project Netball, we passed that Netball, but when she stepped down, the Netball project died, and then we say, let's start athletics, we start giving scholarships to, to those kids 
who has no money, who are poor from the poor family. We identify them from the primary school competition. We give them scholarship at our school. We develop them. And we take to America for high performance coaching. And we are still doing. Unfortunately, my coach, Ron Davis, died. But his dream and my dream will still go along. That these students who are in my school, I'm giving them, I'm spending much of my money. A year I'm paying like $60,000, I mean 60,000, 60 million Tanzanian shillings, which is about $30,000. So a year I'm spending that to give scholarship to these kids. And I'm sure when they go to America to high performance coaches, one day they will participate and say they will win medals at the Olympic Games. One of the girls right now, she's doing very well. She's in Northern Colorado. And the one boy is leaving to go to one of the junior college in uh, Arizona. And next year we have got another one going to Alabama. So there are so many in our list. And uh, I might need assistance. I might need help, you know. This is a big project. Mm -hmm. I have a hospital and I want my hospital or my health center to be post medicine school. I'm working on that. You know, there are so many things I'm dealing with right now with my foundation. And uh, I cannot do it myself without some people contributing. The contribution is coming, might come from the book. You buy the book, not just reading, but you contribute. Wow. Okay, well, that's a good reason for people to buy your book. Even if they don't know your story, they might be interested to read your story, but they might also be interested to support the development of these important uh, projects in Tanzania. Yes. Yes. So you you just mentioned uh, very briefly your uh, coach Ron Davis, and he was actually your second coach, and he coached you only for a few years, and then he moved yeah. away from Tanzania. But you had built a lasting relationship with him. What was so special about Ron Davis? Well, Ron Davis, uh, you know, we have gone up and down. So Ron Davis is a good coach because I like him. He's a strict one, and you know, he we always fight. We always fight. Sometimes he. You know, you know, coach. Some of the coaches, I love the type of his, of his coaching because he wants to put you into the extreme, into the maximum. Some of the coaches they don't put Arthur into the maximum stage. You know, they want the the Arthur say, no, um, coach, I'm just feeling that, and say, okay, we we'll rest. But Ron will say, please think twice. It has to come from your heart. If it is true that you are really tired, we already say, you don't. You, it is not me competing on the track. It is yourself. You don't train hard, it's up to you. I learned from that one. And uh, when we get together, Ron doesn't push. He makes comments. He gives you program. And sometimes we enjoy his program. When he was in Tanzania, 1978, 1979, 1980, we, I really enjoyed You know, at that time, I really broken my record, right? That was before the Olympic Games. I got my medal at the Olympic Games before he was our training coach. But I will not say that he, he coached me when I broke the world record in the middle distance, no. But for me to get the medal, we have so much discussion, changing the event from the 15 to the to the, to the steeplechase. It was difficult for me to change, but I told him, I said, Ron, I am getting old. I'm almost 25. I'm almost more than 25. I'm, 20, I'm almost 27, 28. Now there are these British people, British guys, British kids, young men coming up. I mean, those are who? Those are Sebastian Coe and, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and Steve Ovet. They were young and they were dominating the eight and the missus and 15. I said, I don't have chance in Moscow. Why can't we step down, I mean, step up and go up and go for the steeplechase? I didn't have any experience for steeplechase, but I said, I think I can jump and sprint between Hado and Hado. Then he said, okay, we discussed and he said, okay, let's let's try in more in, 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 in in Stockholm, we went to one of the invitations there. He said, if I can run under 820, then he will allow me to change. I ran that one. I ran very good time, 818, 818, 817. Wow. And that was the time. And that was very close to 1980s Olympic Games because it was the time to register for the events at the Olympic Games. And then he said, okay, now I'm pleased. We can register for the steeplechase. Forget about the 400, 800 meters or 15. We forgot. That is our discussion with him. That's why I said I like him because we discussed and we came together. No blames. When I I I I I didn't win the gold, there was no complaint. Nobody was blamed. 
you know, we are all happy, but I could have won the gold medal, but I missed something in my technique. I missed something and I, because nobody can catch someone. If the water jump, you are almost three meters ahead of everyone. But you can see at the water jump, Malinowski jumped before me and it was only one hurdle left, one hurdle to the finish. So that was my misjudgment of my race. And then we all agree and we all we were all happy, no complaints, no blames, no nothing with Ron Davis. And that is the type of a coach that I liked him and our, our relationship started, I mean, uh, I mean uh, continued even after he moved to Mozambique, he went to Mauritius, and then he went to he went back to Nigeria and all that. But we were still communicating until 1918, I mean 2018, when he wanted to come back. And it was good timing because at that time I started this program of having young athletes uh, in my program. So he told me that he's ready to help. We can work together and get these kids chance to go to school in America and get high performance coaches. Wow. And, this is and that's why even when he died, I buried beside my wife in my compound that this is what I can give him, my family. And we agree with my family and his family flew from America. They come here and we agreed, let him rest all his mm -hmm. life here in Tanzania in my compound. Every time in the morning I woke up, I see his grave and, his, and my wife. So these are my people, even if when I die, that is the place where I'm going to be put. Mm -hmm. Oh wow! Yeah, it sounds like he was a he was a special person, and uh, he he was he was he was my he was my brother, he was my coach, he was my mentor. All the three things to me that's made me to put him here. Yeah, well, you can give words and describe it, but a, a gesture like that uh, speaks much much louder, I think. Yeah, um, and. I read in your book that when, when, when eventually it might not be in your lifetime, but when eventually you get your synthetic track, uh, it's going to be the Ron Davis Memorial track. Well, yeah, that is, that is true. We can, they can share, they can share with somebody who is going to build, who is going to contribute more, you know, yeah. you can just make a name, Ron Davis, somebody else, you know, I mean, I don't, you know, I was telling people that uh, if they can have this project here, it doesn't mean to be like Fiddled by Stadium, no. It can be anybody, Ron Davis, something else, you know, I mean, somebody who contributed more. Ron has contributed his part, and then we can have somebody who can contribute more. You can, uh, you can share that. You, you yourself have, have, uh, have held many senior uh, administrative positions in track and field. And I think you mentioned that you're currently uh, a member of the National Olympic Committee. I'm the Secretary General of the National Olympic Committee. What about the IOC, the International Olympic Committee? Do you... No, um, no, I am not. I was the, I was the IWF. I mean, at that time it was IWF technical member, and I, I was also, I was, I used to also be the, the Commonwealth Games uh, Sports Committee member. I've reached the stage of IOC because IOC, you know, there are so many politics there. Yeah. You know, I mean, everybody can't go there. You know, people have to know you. You know, it's no who. You know, so. But. But because there's many politics, that's why we need uh, good people uh, with good values like Philbert Bailly to be members. Uh, you know, you, you, what you are saying is good. I tried several times to my name to be sent by the by the by the Olympic Committee of Tanzania, but uh, they rejected mm -hmm. several times. That's why I'm saying it's politics. Mm -hmm. um, maybe uh, somebody will be listening to our podcast in the future, so we will say to them, "Hey, if you have some influence." Uh, Lord Co or someone like that have some influence with the International Olympic Committee. Um, you should be getting Philbert Bailly considered for a position. It would be a good thing. Hey, wait! I'm telling you, I worked for the Olympic for the Olympic for almost twenty more than twenty years, right? Yeah, and I tried about three times to be the IOC member. All the applications were rejected. You yeah. know, and it is not. It doesn't mean that I haven't done anything. No, all this. I'm doing here is not for me, it's for the for the Olympics. This case at the end of the day, go to the Olympic Games. You know, even um, I, even if when I ask, let's say, the, the International Federation about helping me in this, uh, uh, assisting me in building the synthetic track, it is not my track. It is the people of Tanzania. It's the kids from Tanzania. 
who one day will participate in the competition, because I'm not going to run myself in this stadium, which I'm in the synthetic track when I do it. It is, it is for the Tanzanians. Usually it's only one person bringing it up, but then the users will be so many. Yeah, you're setting this up for future generations, just like yeah. your school. Yeah. Your school, you yes. didn't go to that school. You set it up for all the other kids that are going to come uh, through the school system. Mm. <laughs> so uh, where can people get a copy of your book? Well, what's the best place? Uh, the best way is, I mean, where now we're in America or in... Uh... Most of our listeners are in America or Europe. Well, yeah, you know, like you can get from uh, Amazon. You, if you, you know, you can just Google. I mean, there is a link there. If you Google Amazon, they should but buy Catch Me If You Can. And then Maya and Maya, the same, feel but buy Catch Me If You Can. And then uh, book the depository, you know, uh, Miles. You know, Miles? Mm -hmm. yes. Miles, Miles has got his uh, his link, which is uh, Soul Seas Publishing, yeah. You got Once Upon a Time. In the vest block spot now, Ville Ville, I mean, the same as you can say, super buy, catch me if you can. These are the five areas where you can get the book. We could definitely find it on Amazon and yeah. uh, Solstice Publishing uh, yeah. and post those links in the in the show notes. And if you wanted to send us the links for the other for the other places, then um, no we problem. can post those yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah, we'll put them in the notes. So yeah, anybody who be. wants a copy of the book, they can go to the place that they like the best. Yeah, usually in America, you know, if they go in America, there is this book depository, there is this uh, solicit. Yeah. Publishing, and once upon a time, if you go to Europe and Africa, they can buy it from Maya and Maya and Amazon. Okay. And um where can people follow you if they wanted to follow you on social media? Well, um, I'm in um I'm in Instagram, I'm in uh I mean, uh, WhatsApp, you know, WhatsApp is the one which I'm using most, but um, I don't really, you know, sometimes uh, I'm so busy, I don't even go to this Instagram and what, but sometimes I go there, but WhatsApp is, uh, is the best one. Okay. So um, maybe we can give uh, our opinion of the book, Alan? This, 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 this was a book where I got very, ex I got very excited because with my, with my age, um, yeah. I, I, when I first got interested in, in, uh, track and field, uh, the first big, before the great British rivalry between Co and Ovet, the first yeah. big rivalry that I came across that got me really excited, uh, between two, uh, two, uh, star runners in the 1500 meters was Philbert Bailly and John Walker. So this, for me, this has been a privilege to talk to one of my legends, uh, from <laughs> from my youth um, in in running, so thank you for your time uh, for that. Uh, You're uh, welcome. Bai was the young African from an unknown country that nobody knew, and he completely redefined how the fifteen hundred meters was run and forced everybody else, uh, all the other athletes, forced them to change how they they approached the fifteen hundred meters. And I had to deal with this this young guy, Philbert Bai, who changed changed the. Uh, Changed the, the 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 rules really and how how running went. Um, all the all the running stuff I remember well from my my youth, um, but I didn't realize what an amazing person Philbert was. Going back to his country and building schools and education projects, a person of true integrity and service. Whether it was in the army, following the rules in the army, or serving as an administrator to try and develop the sport and schools in in his country. Um, the book really showed me another aspect of uh, of Philbert's life. Um, I, I would say get the book and and do also do yourself a favor and go on YouTube and look at 1974 Commonwealth Games 1500 meters in Christchurch or 1975 Dream Mile in uh, Kingston, Jamaica. Obviously, the video is not very high quality because it's the 70s, but the actual races are totally unbelievable. For the for the time that they were running, so um, uh, a, a fantastic story, a fantastic life, uh, and uh, a great legacy, Philbert. So for me, um, I will admit that I didn't know who Philbert Bailly was before finding out about the book, but his story was amazing. Uh, Philbert has made an impact on many lives, not just with running, but also after hanging up his spikes and creating Philbert Bailly schools in Tanzania. 
Filbert's path wasn't without hardship. He, uh, his repeated malaria infection during his running career probably robbed him of several gold medals, but he never dwells on that. He just continues to look forward towards the future and his next goals, which is an example that we should all follow. If you like a good story about overcoming obstacles, then you will love Catch Me If You Can. If you feel like you've lost faith in humanity because of all the bad things you've been hearing in the news, I think this book can help restore your faith in humanity. Not only as Philbert, um, as Philbert a great human being, but he came from a family of caring people, met an equally caring wife, and raised kids that continue to care about helping people. His daughter is very involved with running uh, the school that Philbert and Al Anna started together. So a great read. So thank you very much for your time, Philbert. Uh, uh, something, yeah, something which you can even, uh, Alan, something you're going to put there about YouTube and uh, what? You can even, yeah, you can even use YouTube to follow up the schools. They are all in the YouTube, yeah, schools. If you click, let's say, if you will buy schools. You oh, click really? Everything. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. wow. We'll add that to the... Uh... So Philbert, buy schools, have uh, have some YouTube as well. Uh -huh. Yeah, you can get everything there. Yeah. Okay. So thank you for listening to another episode of Running Book Reviews. Big thank you to the publisher Stol Solstice, in particular, Miles, uh, for providing a review copy of the book. Big thanks yeah. to Philbert for spending time with us today. If you'd like to leave us feedback about how we can improve the podcast or want to suggest a book that you would like for us to review in the future episode, please leave us a comment on social media. We are running book reviews on Facebook and Instagram. And on Twitter, we are reviews underscore running. Please also follow us on social media to find out about new episodes when they're released. Or you can just subscribe to the podcast on your favorite streaming platform. If you've been listening for a while and are wondering how you can help us out, there are a few ways. If you're enjoying the podcast, spread the word. Tell your friends about us or share a link to your favorite episode with a running partner. Leave us a review on Apple Podcasts if this is how you listen to your podcast. You can also rate us on Spotify out of five stars. We prefer five stars, but if we only deserve one, then you can put that. Uh, we are also on buy me a coffee where you can buy us a coffee but you can also just follow us and sometimes uh, we post little extra things that we're doing with our running um, and you can just follow us and you'll get an email notification whenever we post something that's it for now bye for now thank you very much